Once I did, I thought, look, occupation is ugly, okay, but it's for security. Israel has got to secure its population. It's got to secure its country. That's, that's the, the job of Israel. What's confusing to me now about this argument is that if you want to secure your, your country, you would want to define your borders and secure them well. But Israel, in its whole history, has never officially defined its own borders. Uh, its borders have grown over time onto another people's land. Does this make it safer? You know, if you want to secure your, your citizens, would you pay them sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to go live on the so-called enemy's territory? You know, a lot of the Israelis we hear about being killed are living, relatively at least vulnerably, on somebody else's land. They're not safe at all, comparatively. You know, if you want to uh, separate Palestinians from Israelis, why would you build a wall between Palestinians and Palestinians? Leaving tens of thousands of Palestinians now on the wrong side of the wall, separated from their communities, their jobs, their schools, their hospitals, their fields, um, their families, um, exposed to Israel, where they do not have rights, does that make Israel safer? Now, it is really easy to get sort of caught up in the question of security, given surely that anyone who's been under attack, including Israelis, um, feel fear and want to do something to protect themselves. It's very easy to get into this sort of rhetoric of security, but when we see the way that these, these institutions are actually implemented on the ground, they don't make sense within the context of security. So if it's not about security, what is it about? What is going on here? Is it just something totally bizarre or rational? Of course not. Um, what's going on here, I think, is very well illustrated by this series of four maps showing the progression of land transfer in the area now for uh, more than 60 years. So the green areas in these maps indicate Palestinian land. The white areas in the first map indicates land purchased by Jewish immigrants who were coming over from Europe either because they were Zionists or because they had nowhere else to go. Uh, my grandmother tried to come to Palestine. Um, a lot of people were coming fleeing, feeling that they could not be safe anywhere, certainly within uh, Europe. And by 1946, they had acquired about 8% of the land in the area. Um, this, by the way, was in contrast, contrast to the Palestinian Jewish population, which I'll talk about later, who had been living in the area in relative harmony. And they were not, for the most part, Zionists. They were more looking at a, a Palestinian national movement, the way that, that Jews and Christians were in other um, countries that eventually got statehood, like uh, Lebanon, Syria. Um, anyway, so that's 1946. In 1947, after, of course, tremendous persecution, again, of Jews in Europe, the UN proposed to give Jewish people 54% of this part of the Middle East to the Jewish people so that they could create finally a Jewish state, which had been their dream. And that left Palestinians with about 46%, the green areas in the second map. So, you know, imagine you're Palestinian and you are being offered about half of what you kind of already thought was your land. The Palestinians didn't think this was terribly generous on the part of the UN. Um, and likewise, Zionist forces had a major problem. Um, of course, they were pleased with partition. They had lobbied for it in the United Nations. It was a big game, 8 to 54%. But they had a big problem, and that is that they wanted to create a Jewish state. This was their dream, I believe, for understandable reasons. They felt fearful, and they wanted a Jewish state. They wanted to not be a minority. They wanted to create a Jewish state, but there were all of these non-Jews who were living there. The majority of the people who were living in the area where they wanted to create a Jewish state simply were not Jewish. They were Muslim and they were Christian. And Zionist forces, understanding these demographic realities and speaking about it candidly, and I can give you many quotations from my book, proceeded then in a systematic, calculated way to expel the vast majority of the Christian and Muslim population from the area in what became known, as I said, this afternoon, uh, what became known to Israelis as the War of Independence to be celebrated later this week. That same period is known to Palestinians as al-Nakba, which means the catastrophe. And the Nakba continues to be mourned because the Palestinians who were expelled in that period of time have never been allowed to return. The expulsions went beyond 54% into 78%. And here, for example, is um, are the maps 
showing, first of all, at first 54%, but then eventually 78% of purple areas. And then um, some of the 500 Palestinian villages that were raised and depopulated in the area. I, I uh, read today at uh, lunch the names of the 16 Palestinian villages killed only today, May 12th in 1948. This, by the way, was before a single Arab soldier had come into the area. This was before May, um, uh, May 15th or 14th. So. Um, anyway, so the, the refugees going, coming from these uh, villages were forced to flee. Many went into the West Bank, into the Gaza Strip, into the Golan Heights, into uh, the rest of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt. Uh, many are here today in this room. And the refugees have not ever been allowed to return to their homes and lands. Um, and I recently, again, went on this trip through the diaspora, meeting many of these Palestinian refugees. Um, many of them still carry around their, their land deeds, their titles. Um, showing this is, my, this is my land, this is my home, this is my title, I didn't sell it, it belongs to me, it's you know, 50, 60 miles that way, and I can't go to it because I'm not Jewish. Uh, here's a Nakba survivor, many of them still have the keys to their homes. You know, during, during uh, the, the Nakba, many of them heard about massacres like Dir Yassin and hurriedly could have left their homes. He talks about remembering the bullets kind of flying past him every Every person has their own story. Um, but they sort of hurriedly you know, locked their doors and ran away, expecting they'll be back in a week or two. And now, 61 years later, they have never been allowed to return to their homes and lands. And, and looking, you know, looking at this person, um, the, the irony to me that I went to his home and he, he, um, he fed me, he treated me with incredible respect, was incredibly hospitable, living in horrible circumstances in a refugee camp. Um, and, and he welcomed me, and that I can go to his land. You know, he can't go, but I can go to his land. And, and I can buy his land. And I can lease his land. And I can, uh, I can farm his land, and I can build a house on his land. And, and if his house is still there, I can live in his house on his land. He can't even visit, because he's not Jewish. And you know, we, we hear so much about an Israeli state, a Jewish state, the sort of natural, obvious necessity of this existence. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean if having a Jewish state, if having a Jewish majority requires discriminating against Christians and Muslims? Does that change anything? No. What does it mean if finding a place for one diaspora means creating a whole new diaspora? You know, is that something that we can accept? It's not something I can accept, and of course it's also not our decision to accept that or not. Um, many of these, these are, uh, these are doctors, they're lawyers, they are school teachers, they are musicians, they are scientists, um, and again, incredibly, uh, actually a very well-educated uh, population. Palestinians are traditionally, in addition to being relatively secular um, compared to other uh, places in the area, are also a very well-educated population, reduced to living in incredible squalor um, simply because of their religion and their ethnicity, even if many of them own uh, homes, own land, own businesses. Of course, the elderly people in every single one of these camps all remember. They have their own story from the Nakba. What village they're from, what happened on that day, whatever day it might have been before or after Israel's creation. In fact, this is um, a woman, Um Hussein, who I met in a refugee camp outside of uh, Damascus. And she uh, became a refugee in 1948. But prior to that, she had been in love with a Jewish man. And she told me this incredible love story. Um, anyway, in 1948, she was kicked out along with the rest of her family. And they went to the Golan Heights to live in Syria. And then, less than 20 years later, she became a refugee all over again. She lost her husband. She lost some of her children in 1967. Has come now to Damascus. Has rebuilt her life again and again. And this is really what has come the, the, the experience for so many Palestinians. Refugees not just once, but sometimes twice, three times. What the occupation is doing, you know, what, what Israel's done in those, in those pictures that I showed you of the occupation, most of the Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank and Gaza are already refugees, about 60% of them. So what is being threatened is not even 
um, their, their sort of basic rights. Their basic rights have been taken away. Now we're talking about the new life that they have tried to create, sort of this perpetual refugee uh, status, uh, imagining we can all, or try all to imagine how traumatic, of course, that is. And especially given, as Um Hussein loves to point out, the way